Chapters one and two of Book six of Les Miserables, Volume three by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Les Miserables, Volume three by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book six. The Conjunction of Two Stars. Chapter one. The Sobriquet mode of formation of family names marius was at this epoch a handsome young man of medium stature with thick and intensely black hair a lofty and intelligent brow well opened and passionate nostrils an air of calmness and sincerity and with something indescribably proud thoughtful and innocent over his whole countenance his profile all of whose lines were rounded without thereby losing their firmness had a certain germanic sweetness which has made its way into the french physiognomy by way of alsace and lorraine and that complete absence of angles which rendered the sicambres so easily recognizable among the romans and which distinguishes the leonine from the aquiline race he was at that period of life when the mind of men who think is composed in nearly equal parts of depth and ingenuousness a grave situation being given he had all that is required to be stupid one more turn of the key and he might be sublime his manners were reserved cold polished not very genial as his mouth was charming his lips the reddest and his teeth the whitest in the world his smile corrected the severity of his face as a whole at certain moments that pure brow and that voluptuous smile presented a singular contrast his eyes were small but his glance was large at the period of his most abject misery he had observed that young girls turned round when he passed by and he fled or hid with death in his soul he thought that they were staring at him because of his old clothes and that they were laughing at him the fact is that they stared at him because of his grace and that they dreamed of him this mute misunderstanding between him and the pretty passers-by had made him shy he chose none of them for the excellent reason that he fled from all of them he lived thus indefinitely stupidly as courfeyrac said courfeyrac also said to him do not aspire to be venerable they called each other thou it is the tendency of youthful friendships to slip into this mode of address let me give you a piece of advice my dear fellow don't read so many books and look a little more at the lasses the jades have some good points about them o marius by dint of fleeing and blushing you will become brutalized on other occasions courfeyrac encountered him and said good morning monsieur l'abbe when courfeyrac had addressed to him some remark of this nature marius avoided women both young and old more than ever for a week to come and he avoided courfeyrac to boot nevertheless there existed in all the immensity of creation two women whom marius did not flee and to whom he paid no attention whatever in truth he would have been very much amazed if he had been informed that they were women one was the bearded old woman who swept out his chamber and caused courfeyrac to say seeing that his servant woman wears his beard marius does not wear his own beard the other was a sort of little girl whom he saw very often and whom he never looked at for more than a year marius had noticed in one of the walks of the luxembourg the one which skirts the parapet of the pepiniere a man and a very young girl who were almost always seated side by side on the same bench at the most solitary end of the alley on the rue de l'ouest side every time that that chance which meddles with the strolls of persons whose gaze is turned inwards led marius to that walk and it was nearly every day he found this couple there the man appeared to be about sixty years of age he seemed sad and serious his whole person presented the robust and weary aspect peculiar to military men who have retired from the service if he had worn a decoration marius would have said he is an ex-officer he had a kindly but unapproachable air and he never let his glance linger on the eyes of any one he wore blue trousers a blue frock-coat and a broad-brimmed hat which always appeared to be new a black cravat a quaker shirt that is to say it was dazzlingly white but of coarse linen a grisette who passed near him one day said 
Here's a very tidy widower. His hair was very white. The first time that the young girl who accompanied him came and seated herself on the bench which they seemed to have adopted, she was a sort of child thirteen or fourteen years of age, so thin as to be almost homely, awkward, insignificant, and with a possible promise of handsome eyes. Only they were always raised with a sort of displeasing assurance. Her dress was both aged and childish, like the dress of the scholars in a convent. It consisted of a badly cut gown of black merino. They had the air of being father and daughter. Marius scanned this old man, who was not yet aged, and this little girl, who was not yet a person, for a few days, and thereafter paid no attention to them. They, on their side, did not appear even to see him. They conversed together with a peaceful and indifferent air. The girl chattered incessantly and merrily. The old man talked but little, and at times he fixed on her eyes overflowing with an ineffable paternity. Marius had acquired the mechanical habit of strolling in that walk. He invariably found them there. This is the way things went. Marius liked to arrive by the end of the alley which was furthest from their bench. He walked the whole length of the alley, passed in front of them, then returned to the extremity whence he had come, and began again. This he did five or six times in the course of his promenade, and the promenade was taken five or six times a week, without its having occurred to him or to these people to exchange a greeting. That personage and that young girl, although they appeared, and perhaps because they appeared, to shun all glances, had naturally caused some attention on the part of the five or six students who strolled along the Pépinière from time to time. The studious, after their lectures, the others after their game of billiards. Courfeyrac, who was among the last, had observed them several times, but finding the girl homely, he had speedily and carefully kept out of the way. He had fled, discharging at them a sobriquet, like a Parthian dart. Impressed solely with the child's gown and the old man's hair, he had dubbed the daughter Mademoiselle La Noire and the father Monsieur Leblanc so that, as no one knew them under any other title, this nickname became a law in the default of any other name. The students said, Ah, Monsieur Leblanc is on his bench. And Marius, like the rest, had found it convenient to call this unknown gentleman Monsieur Leblanc. We shall follow their example, and we shall say Monsieur Leblanc, in order to facilitate this tale. So Marius saw them nearly every day, at the same hour, during the first year. He found the man to his taste, but the girl insipid. CHAPTER Two, LUX FACTA EST During the second year, precisely at the point in this history which the reader has now reached, it chanced that this habit of the Luxembourg was interrupted, without Marius himself being quite aware why, and nearly six months elapsed during which he did not set foot in the alley. One day, at last, he returned thither once more. It was a serene summer morning, and Marius was in joyous mood, as one is when the weather is fine. It seemed to him that he had in his heart all the songs of the birds that he was listening to, and all the bits of blue sky of which he caught glimpses through the leaves of the trees. He went straight to his alley, and when he reached the end of it he perceived, still on the same bench, that well-known couple. Only when he approached, it certainly was the same man, but it seemed to him that it was no longer the same girl. The person whom he now beheld was a tall and beautiful creature, possessed of all the most charming lines of a woman, at the precise moment when they are still combined with all the most ingenuous graces of the child, a pure and fugitive moment, which can be expressed only by these two words, fifteen years. She had wonderful brown hair, shaded with threads of gold, a brow that seemed made of marble, cheeks that seemed made of rose-leaf, a pale flush, an agitated whiteness, an exquisite mouth, whence smiles darted like sunbeams and words like music, a head such as Raphael would have given to Mary, set upon a neck that Jean Goujon would have attributed to a Venus and in order that nothing might be lacking to this bewitching face her nose was not handsome it was pretty neither straight nor curved neither italian nor greek 
it was the parisian nose that is to say spiritual delicate irregular pure which drives painters to despair and charms poets when marius passed near her he could not see her eyes which were constantly lowered he saw only her long chestnut lashes permeated with shadow and modesty this did not prevent the beautiful child from smiling as she listened to what the white-haired old man was saying to her and nothing could be more fascinating than that fresh smile combined with those drooping eyes for a moment marius thought that she was another daughter of the same man a sister of the former no doubt but when the invariable habit of his stroll brought him for the second time near the bench and he had examined her attentively he recognized her as the same in six months the little girl had become a young maiden that was all nothing is more frequent than this phenomenon there is a moment when girls blossom out in the twinkling of an eye and become roses all at once one left them children but yesterday to-day one finds them disquieting to the feelings the child had not only grown she had become idealized as three days in april sufficed to cover certain trees with flowers six months had sufficed to clothe her with beauty her april had arrived one sometimes sees people who poor and mean seem to wake up pass suddenly from indigence to luxury indulge in expenditures of all sorts and become dazzling prodigal magnificent all of a sudden that is the result of having pocketed an income a note fell due yesterday the young girl had received her quarterly income and then she was no longer the schoolgirl with her felt hat her merino gown her scholar's shoes and red hands taste had come to her with beauty she was a well-dressed person clad with a sort of rich and simple elegance and without affectation she wore a dress of black damask a cape of the same material and a bonnet of white crepe her white gloves displayed the delicacy of the hand which toyed with the carved chinese ivory handle of a parasol and her silken shoe outlined the smallness of her foot when one passed near her her whole toilette exhaled a youthful and penetrating perfume as for the man he was the same as usual the second time that marius approached her the young girl raised her eyelids her eyes were of a deep celestial blue but in that veiled azure there was as yet nothing but the glance of a child she looked at marius indifferently as she would have stared at the brat running beneath the sycamores or the marble vase which cast a shadow on the bench and marius on his side continued his promenade and thought about something else he passed near the bench where the young girl sat five or six times but without even turning his eyes in her direction on the following days he returned as was his wont to the luxembourg as usual he found there the father and daughter but he paid no further attention to them he thought no more about the girl now that she was beautiful than he had when she was homely he passed very near the bench where she sat because such was his habit end of book 6 chapters 1 and 2